Hello everyone. My name is Susan Hepburn and I'm really pleased to be here today to talk with you about early signs of autism spectrum disorder in young girls. I'm currently a professor at Colorado State University in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies where we are trying to launch several projects looking at improving autism identification across the lifespan. I'm quite interested in understanding how people with the same overall constellation of difficulties that, that uh, characterize autism, problems in social communication and range of interests and overall flexibility, how individuals with that common profile can also present so very differently. And um, many of us have been developing some working models of the kinds of ways to uh, take into account some of these differences. And as I hope to discuss today, we're seeing some um, really important advances in the field of understanding symptom progression over time that I hope will be helpful in improving our identification efforts. So for today, I am hoping to do a very brief overview of the markers of ASD in young children. I recognize that our audience is highly skilled and you are probably very familiar with a lot of these. I'm going to spend more of my time looking at the symptom pattern differences that we are learning about from the research in boys and girls, particularly during the toddler and early childhood periods. Then my hope is to share with you a handful of strategies that have uh, impacted my personal practice and that I hope you will find useful to consider for your practice. These strategies are not based in empirical evidence. I have not studied them explicitly to determine that they are the so-called right way to go, but I want to share them as things to consider in your clinical practice. So there is substantial research out there to draw from regarding what the uh, early childhood profile of ASD looks like. However, we're also learning that some of the things that we are trained to look for that signal risk for autism in young children may not be as evident in young girls as they are in young boys. So I'd like to propose that as a field, we need to consider a broader set of markers when we're evaluating a young girl for possible autism spectrum disorder. And in a topic that probably goes uh, too far beyond the time we have today, there are also some very interesting insights that could be gleaned from watching the development of girls on the spectrum over time, particularly in comparison to the development of autism symptoms in boys over time. By understanding those complex developmental trajectories, we may begin to learn more about the actual nature of autism itself and what we need to do to help different children at different times. Now, as I mentioned, I'm trained as a child clinical psychologist, and most of my work prior to coming to CSU was at JFK Partners at the School of Medicine at UC Denver. So I have worked primarily in a research and a clinical context, but I've also been really fortunate over the past uh, 20 plus years to do ongoing uh, school consultation work, particularly in Littleton Public Schools and a few other districts, where I've been actively engaged with educational identification teams, and we've really tried to wrestle with some of the best ways to talk about autism symptoms as they present in students in school and to also try to generate good protocols and solid ways of communicating with our colleagues and with families when we begin to see some of the behaviors that could signal that uh, an evaluation for educational uh, identification could be important. So I do want to remember that what I'm talking about today, while somewhat clinical, is going to be couched in the educational identification of ASD. So I recognize that as a clinical psychologist, what I do in a clinical eval is going to differ from what educational teams are doing in their educational identification evals, but I think both processes can really inform the other. So for today, I'm going to review some of the research on sex differences in our ability to identify people with ASD, talk briefly about those early markers, talk to you about different symptom profiles and males and females across development, at least what the research is telling us, and then discuss, I guess we have nine implications for practice when evaluating. I do need to let you know that I kind of went down the rabbit hole in researching this topic and I am grateful to the help of a very talented recent graduate from Colorado State University, Kendall Nolan, 
who is uh, a self-advocate and working in the developmental disabilities community in Northern Colorado. We'll hear from Kendall toward the end of this talk as um, her commitment to improving identification and support for females on the spectrum has really been um, important in shaping how I think about it as well. So my thanks to Kendall for her perspective and for gathering so much of the research that I'll be talking with you about today. And Kendall, if I ever do read every single article, I'll be sure to let you know. So let's start with sex differences in ASD identification. As many of you know, we identify boys about four times more often than we identify girls with autism spectrum disorder. In fact, the prevalence estimates from several well-designed studies tend to suggest that one in 42 males presents with significant symptoms of autism and one in 189 females also present with these symptoms through the surveillance methods that are done in public health work, which is primarily record review. So it's really important to note as we're looking at these numbers that prevalence estimates are about record review and who looks like they might have it. It's not necessarily the same as if you did a full diagnostic workup. But because surveillance studies are designed to give us reliable numbers over time, we can look at any changes over time, which can be helpful for understanding causes, and we can look for uh, different patterns within subgroups because we're using the same methodology to find boys as we're using to find girls. So not only do we identify them with a the diagnosis less often, but we aren't picking them up even when we're doing record review surveillance studies of risks. We also know from the research that girls are usually identified later than boys, usually years later. And there are different data for different states. In general, in the United States, the average age of identification for boys still hovers at around four years of age. There are places where we're doing a better job in identifying more younger children. But if you consider the average age for boys to be around four, some of the available data from Shattuck and colleagues suggests that girls aren't identified until closer to the age of eight. So that is a significant gap in identification and really shuts the door on any possibilities for um, early intervention. As you look at these data more closely, what you'll discover is that as a field, we're pretty good at identifying girls who also have an intellectual impairment in addition to autism. And this intellectual impairment doesn't have to be severe. It could be in the mild range or even borderline, and they're more likely to be identified. It's girls who have intact cognitive functioning or are perceived to be particularly bright who are most likely to be missed particularly when evaluated in early childhood, but also sometimes across the lifespan. So what are the early markers of ASD? Well, we've learned a lot from particularly the Baby Siblings Consortium project about the symptoms to look for in the first year of life. For those of you who may be unfamiliar, the Baby Sibs Consortium Project is an international attempt to try to understand what autism looks like from birth through early childhood by identifying families who have one or more children with autism and then getting involved and observing and studying their children, the children that they have after they've found out they have another child with autism. In other words, we're capitalizing on the genetics of autism and recognizing that approximately 18 to 25 percent of younger brothers and sisters of somebody on the spectrum is going to present with some significant symptoms of autism. So by following these babies from birth who we don't know yet if they have autism, but they have a brother or sister who does, we've been able over time, thanks to the work of um, really some an exceptional research teams in Canada and the United States to see these markers of ASD in the first year of life. So what we know is that early on you see developmental delays in sensory motor functioning. So you could see reflexes being held on too long, for example. We see a reduced gaze fixation at six months. In other words, it's very difficult for um, boys in particular at young ages to maintain their attention to faces. Whereas when we talk in a few minutes, infant girls may actually 
look at faces too long and have a hard time shifting away, which could be relevant clinically years later. We also see in the first year of life that there's a limited range of intonation in a young child or a baby's babbling. So we see this limited range communicatively from the start. In the second year of life, we begin to see developmental delays in several aspects of social communication. So it's often talked about that young children who turn out to have ASD tend to not follow an adult's point so they don't um, respond to bids of joint attention as frequently as toddlers without ASD. We also tend to see significant delays in language understanding and fine motor skills, particularly relative to the ability to solve problems that don't involve language or what we would call nonverbal cognition. Atypical eye contact, in other words, not particularly meshed with other nonverbal communicative behaviors, is often observed in the, the second year of life, as is poor visual tracking of objects, suggesting that the um, sensory motor system and the neurological integrity of the developing infant is uh, impaired in ways that can be subtle and hard to track. There also appear to be some findings that there is difficulty for young children on the spectrum, both boys and girls, to disengage their attention, particularly when they're looking at something fear-inspiring, anxiety-producing, or unpleasant. It's almost as though in young children, the difficulty shifting attention that we see in older people with ASD results in really kind of being stuck at um, focusing on upsetting content without the uh, tool of being able to look away and feel better. And that difficulty could get in the way of referencing caregivers who can give you comfort when you're upset and may, in my opinion, actually set the scene for the emotional dysregulation we often see later. But that has yet to be proven in the research. And then lastly, the other marker we are used to looking for is an inconsistent response to name. So a tendency to be in one's own world and uh, not really responding to the bids of others. We also see less looking at caregivers' faces, less monitoring of what other people are looking at, less frequent imitation, especially when there are no objects involved and it's purely for social play and less shared affect, particularly a range of affect, and as I mentioned before, less frequent joint attention behaviors. So overall, we know that in the first two years of life, there are several things that we could be looking for that will help us identify young children who may be presenting with signs or symptoms of an autism spectrum disorder. But what do we know about the different symptom patterns that there may be between females and males across development. <clears throat> well, when you look at the research on sex differences, what you'll find is that we have a lot of contradictory findings. And the short story is that those findings are probably different because researchers have um, been examining different groups of children, recruited in different ways, and have used different methods to evaluate them. So for example, studies really differ on who they include, how old they are, if they have other genetic conditions, if, they've, if the children have already been clinically identified, or if they're coming from the broader population. Um, this idea of how they are recruited is really important because the research is going to reflect who's been included in the study. And the differences in recruitment are substantial in this literature. One of the important aspects that I'll be emphasizing today is that many of these studies do not take into account the cognitive or developmental level of the child. And so we could be seeing studies that find differences or don't find differences, but they haven't even looked at whether or not cognitive functioning is driving some of the ways those profiles express themselves. So in general, the better research in the field is developmentally sensitive. We have several studies, for example, that instead of including anybody from the age of 4 to 25 and looking at symptom differences between males and females, those studies are only broadly helpful. We have several studies that look just at 2-year-olds or look at just 3 to 5-year-olds. We also need to pay attention to those studies that take into account the developmental levels of the individuals being assessed. Since we know that as a field we are doing um, kind of 
the, the we're, we're doing least well, I should say, um, identifying girls who have high IQs, we have to be particularly thoughtful about the role of developmental functioning in our assessments. So in general, when you take into account all of the work that has been done, even though more studies have been conducted on older children and adults as far as the sex differences, we find that the evidence base is actually stronger for suggesting that young children probably show more differences in the male versus female phenotype than they do at older ages. So not only do we need to study this particular period more, but we need to pay attention to the findings that those researchers who've approached this with a developmentally sensitive lens have been able to find. So what do we know? Well, during infancy, we'll basically go chronologically here, um, we have some evidence from some cognitive neuroscience protocols that between the ages of 6 and 12 months of age, girls are showing a particular risk for ASD when they show too much attention to social targets. In other words, they have an increased problem looking away from stimuli. And that fixation could be associated with increasing uh, co-occurrence of social anxiety in later years. So there's a sort of hypervigilance or overattending to cues from faces and voices that some of the young infant girls are demonstrating, particularly those who grow up to be high functioning people on the spectrum. So we have to be uh, thoughtful about perhaps as more social information is coming in and there isn't that ability to shift away, that could have some impact on the development of co-occurring anxiety disorders later, which we definitely see in the literature on uh, adolescents and uh, adults, females in particular, with ASD. So whereas the infant literature can give us some gaze shifting paradigms to consider, the toddler literature has a different set of data to offer and some of these findings are contradictory. So one of the first people to study differences in males and females between the ranges of 14 to 35 months was Alice Carter and colleagues and they found there were no differences on parent report of symptoms when they used the ADIR. They did find on the ADOS that the young girls showed more impairments in the communication domain with particular problems in uh, empathizing and withdrawing um, when they are in stress as reported by parents in a few other um, of their parent report measures. They also helped focus us as a field on looking at the cognitive profile on standardized testing. And it turns out that this is a finding that's been replicated by several groups within using in this particular case the Mullen scales of early learning, young girls showed larger discrepancies within their profile than the young boys. In general, girls tended to show relative weaknesses in receptive language and fine motor relative to their visual receptive skills. So it's important to think not only about their overall cognitive performance, but where their discrepancies lay. Another study uh, conducted by Reinhardt and colleagues that used a, a much larger uh, sample size recruited from uh, various web-based portals run by the uh, Florida State University looked at toddlers and compared their social communication skills at the age of 20 months. What was, I think, interesting about this particular study is they included children who eventually received a diagnosis of ASD and also those who were typically developing but matched by age. And what you can see by on this chart is at the top there, that's where you have the typical girls and the typical boys. So these are mean scores from the communication and social behavior skills scales by Weatherby et al. Higher score meaning better social communication skills. And you can see that in this 20-month-old sample, there are very few differences between typical boys and girls. They're right up there at the top. 
When we look at the toddler boys and girls, what you see are no differences in emotion items, a slight advantage for girls in gestures, not meaningful though at all, but when you look at overall attempts to communicate and overall effectiveness of merging nonverbal and verbal communication, you see a relative strength in boys on the spectrum over girls. So perhaps there could be a subtle difference that begins to occur in the second year of life, which over time could cascade into longer term impacts. Several studies have concurred on an important finding that will be very relevant for our practices in early identification. And that is that two-year-old girls who are later found to have confirmed diagnoses of ASD show fewer repetitive behaviors than their male counterparts. Specifically, several groups have noted less um, unusual actions on objects, I guess you might say. There's less frequent spinning, less frequent carrying or over attachment to objects, and overall less abnormal body use. Now that is not to say that there aren't girls who do do some repetitive behaviors, but those who do tend to also have a more significant developmental delay at the time of their autism evaluation. So in general, there appear to be some early emerging differences in that third aspect of what we used to call the triad of autism symptoms, social, communication, and then repetitive behaviors and interests. So repetitive and behaviors and interests could be an area of significant sex differences. Relative to young boys, other studies have shown that girls who turn out to have ASD show more difficulties in the emotion regulation domain, particularly in sharing different types of affect with caregivers, in regulating intense emotions, and in demonstrating empathy. So in my clinical work, just anecdotally, noted that many times girls in the elementary, middle, and high school years are really struggling with making sense of other people's emotions, um, of interpreting emotional information correctly, and regulating their strong responses to what's going on around them is often a challenge for parents and teachers. It's quite possible as we learn more about the early emergence of emotion regulation skills with people on the spectrum that we'll discover that females have a particularly difficult time in this emotional domain. Other studies of toddlers that have stratified their samples by the level of cognitive functioning have also been informative. In one study by Matthias and colleagues, we see that two-year-old girls who have ASD but do not have a significant cognitive delay relative to boys who are also two years old showed more overreactions to sounds, more clumsiness, and more problems with personal space. They also show relative to their male counterparts fewer problems with imitation, preoccupation with parts, and abnormal visual fascinations. So when I look at this particular article, one of the things I thought about is how, you know how in schizophrenia they talk about positive symptoms, those are things that you can see, and then there are negative symptoms such as withdrawal, the things that involve the person, they're kind of internal things, they're the absence of something, it's what you don't see that matters. Here, I think what we might be faced with as a field is that at young ages there are fewer positive symptoms perhaps demonstrated by high functioning girls than by their male counterparts. And when we, um, I think we all pay more attention to unusual behaviors that are right in front of us, then we are able to observe the lack or inconsistency of a behavior we would hope or expect to see. So it's quite possible that um, what we need to be thinking about is less of a focus on taking a term from the schizophrenia literature, positive symptoms, and more of a focus on those negative symptoms or what's actually lacking. When we examine a second comparison, two-year-old girls with ASD and a cognitive delay matched to two-year-old boys with ASD and a cognitive delay, what we see is that the girls present with um, more problems with gesture use, a more limited range of facial expressions, and a lack of exploration and even curiosity, as it's described, than the boys in the study. They also, the girls also tend to show fewer problems attempting to communicate 
and they are reported to interact for purely social purposes more often than their male counterparts. This to me was very consonant with some of my anecdotal experience clinically, where I would be evaluating a two-year-old girl and she would look at my face and smile, or she would initiate an interaction, maybe not be able to sustain it, but that sense of being with me in the room often influenced my thinking that this child was perhaps on the right track socially. Then, if I had the opportunity to see that girl a year or two later, I sometimes saw that the social impairments were more debilitating than I had recognized. And I've begun to wonder if girls, because of some biological differences in brain development, have a spared capacity to um, socially relate. If that does exist, as some of the sex differences studies in typically developing males and females tell us, then perhaps this slight advantage in being able to respond in a social situation, particularly with a one-on-one -on -one adult, could give us the impression that a young girl is less socially affected by autism than she may be. Because as we look in the literature, when social demands are increasing, these social impairments are emerging more and more. So it seems to me that the literature is suggesting to us that in really young children, we should pay attention to the communication profile, we should pay attention to the emotional aspect, and we shouldn't give young girls too much credit if they're a little bit responsive, do a little bit of imitation, and do a little bit of joint attention. Because what we really need to see is how they do with other children in more complex settings, and if those social behaviors can be built upon and deepened, and not just just go through this surface level of responsivity. When we turn our attention to three to five year olds, what we see is that girls are looking better than their male counterparts on um, parent and teacher interviews and socialization and daily living skills. And those better adaptive behaviors um, can be deceptive. When you look at what's required of a four year old socially, it's kind of just the basics. Um, if, if only we were held to the uh, social conventions of four-year-olds, we would all seem socially successful. Unfortunately, other studies tell us that over time, girls who seemed relatively okay in socialization as four-year-olds often struggle with those skills when their parents are interviewed just a few years later. So some of the strengths that we may witness in girls that we have concerns about, we wonder if they're on the spectrum, those strengths that we see in preschool may not maintain across development. As we move our attention to school-aged youth and teens, and I'm going to be very brief here, the literature is deep and I wasn't able to get through it. What we see in general is that girls tend to show less severe repetitive behaviors and um, fewer restricted interests, or if they have those restricted interests, they tend to be more in common with their peers. It's just that they love it more, whereas boys are thought to have a greater likelihood of more unusual interests. Girls are also at increased risk of developing co-occurring internalizing disorders, such as anxiety or depression. This is very significant. In fact, the most common reason for a girl to be referred for an evaluation during the elementary years is for anxiety or depression. I should say the most common reason for girls who are later found to have autism. They are not usually referred because of autism concerns. They're referred for concerns around anxiety, depression, learning disability, or attention. Rarely are autism spectrum disorders the primary reason for asking for an evaluation in the elementary or middle school years across the country is what the data are telling us. Girls tend to show fewer disruptive behavior problems at home and school. That's true whether you have ASD or not. And it is thought that part of the reason that we are under identifying girls in the school system is that they um, are able to kind of fly under the radar and can respond to some of the response to intervention uh, approaches that we take and may not necessarily seem to require identification until we get farther down their educational path and realize that um, there are a lot of gaps in what they've actually learned. And while they can be in the classroom and go with the flow of many classroom routines, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of unidentified girls not actually able to benefit 
from their educational opportunities um, because they're not necessarily engaged at a deep level. But they don't cause a lot of disruption and may not get the attention of the people around them. By the age of nine, Girls on the spectrum tend to show more significant social communication impairment than their male counterparts. They actually tend to show an overall lower cognitive ability and lower adaptive functioning. And this is from a really large study with a more epidemiological reach. So it's uh, something that we can generalize from. What those data tell me is that many of those girls by the age of nine hadn't had the benefit of intervention or identification. And as we'll consider, imagine going through life with a different learning style, uh, with some gaps in your understanding of other people, or um, some nervousness about what the world's about and how to communicate. If no one identifies that you have those challenges, yet you're constantly held to the same standards as everybody around you, without the tools to get there, that alone feels to me like a recipe for anxiety or depression. And as we'll find if you dip into the literature on ASD in women, there's also a lot of research that suggests an overly dependent relationship style and an increased risk for domestic violence as adults. So we need to get better at this. We need to understand what it means to be a girl with autism spectrum disorder. As we look some more into the research on teenagers, we see that girls with intact cognitive ability tend to do something that we're called masking in the literature. And this is where they learn how to compensate for their difficulties by either finding the right situation to be in, or many times a strategy like um, following one child or overly fixating on one child sometimes. Sometimes it's a friendship, sometimes it's a bit of a fixation. But the strategy of doing what the people around you do can help you get by. Masking has long-term adverse consequences, has, has been written about in a lot of first-person accounts as well as by researchers. If you're constantly trying to pretend that you're something other than who you are, that has just an awful effect on how you think about yourself and whether you're worthy. It leads to a lot of social isolation and a lot of learned helplessness and a lack of a sense of competence. It also creates, in my mind, almost like what a person with an obsessive compulsive disorder goes through, which is that constantly fatiguing task of trying to hide the thing that is not okay that if you are constantly vigilant about not wanting someone to find you out, that that alone can detract from your ability to cope and your ability to have a, a positive quality of life. One of the things that I think is a manifestation of masking that we see in school systems is a very frequent observation that I've had in team meetings. Once again, this is anecdotal. I don't know this from empirical evidence, but perhaps it will ring true with your experience. I've been in many meetings where parents have said, the school team is telling me that she behaves well at school, and I believe that. She can hold it together, and she knows that she wants her friends to like her, she needs to behave well, she wants her teacher to like her, etc. But when she comes home, she completely falls apart. I've heard this pattern from so many families, and at first, I think teams would sit back and think, okay, what is it? Well, school has more demands than home. Maybe home's not as structured, and maybe the child has a hard time in unstructured situations. Or sometimes teams have said, maybe at home they don't expect enough from her, or maybe they expect too much. So there are always concerns about the consistency, and sometimes those concerns can come out as judgy, even if they're not intended to be so. I've also heard a lot of parents say, I feel like the school team doesn't believe me, but it's absolutely true. She may not tantrum at school, I don't know how that can be, but from the time she comes home until she goes to bed, she's just a dysregulated mess. Those things are real, and I think that they could be indicators of a young child, a growing child, trying to make it through the day, having enough social cognition to recognize what she's supposed to be doing, but then that eats up all of her resources and she can't maintain good behavior at home. 
So as I said, masking can have long-term adverse consequences, and we may actually see some of those consequences in the girls we're working with in the school system, particularly if not everybody is understanding what the nature of the child's challenges are. That old question of, is it a can't or a won't? And with uh, any child, but particularly with girls in the elementary years, I suggest that we fall back on the assumption of it's a can't and we teach it. And then once we've known that we've taught it, if the child's actually actively choosing not to do the right thing, then it's a won't. But in general, I think we need to provide a lot more support for girls than we currently are. So what are our implications for practice, particularly in the assessment of young girls? Well, first of all, let's think about this idea in the literature that there may be what scientists are calling a female protective factor at play. What this basically means is that maybe there are biological differences in how our brains and nervous systems are structured such that girls have a biological advantage to be kind of geared up to be a little more social than their male counterparts to start with. These are controversial theories. They go into evolutionary biology in ways that we don't have time for today, but they're really interesting. And in general, when you look at the research on differences in behavior in typical girls versus typical boys, you see in the early childhood years several early emerging social strengths. And those strengths are thought to, on a group level, persist across the lifespan. So if there is a female protective factor, that each of us who are female may be born into the world with a nervous system that has a higher probability at being better at these things, then if the girl also has autism, what does that mean? Well, it might mean that if the girl has average to above average IQ, you may be able to see those small social behaviors that are enhanced by this protective factor as really positive and it could mask their underlying impairments until those social demands get more complex. Particularly given that any child who has the cognitive ability can often use a cognitive means to behave better socially, but it may not necessarily be an intuitive way of behaving better socially. So this biological protective factor could lead to an increasing likelihood of girls with average to above average IQ masking their impairments somehow, which is very likely to confuse and frustrate adults who are going to see gaps in development they didn't expect, who might see more problems from third grade on than they ever anticipated, and who may notice and report different behaviors in different contexts. It's a very inconsistent kind of presentation when you have a slight advantage at some of these early social behaviors. For girls with an intellectual disability, it is thought that that protective factor is wiped out by whatever processes are driving the differences in their brain development, such that girls with an intellectual disability are likely to present with even more severe delays that if they have enough problems to kind of overwhelm the female protective effect, the idea is that those problems could be increasingly severe and thus increase the likelihood that we identify girls with ASD when there is a cognitive deficit present. And it turns out that's what the data suggest we're doing. So what are the implications of this? Well, obviously, my first thought is that we absolutely need to make sure that we are assessing a young girl's cognitive and developmental functioning through multiple ways, and we are interpreting the symptoms that we are seeing in social and communication and affect within the lens of that development. I realize that school systems don't always embrace standardized testing for a lot of important reasons. And I realize that there are a lot of problems with the diversity, equity, and inclusion of the norms on these assessments. I would also suggest that until we get something better, and as we're working towards something better, it is important to integrate standardized testing into our young child evaluations, mostly so we can look at standardized um, profiles across um, children, so this child relative to other children her age, but within the child, looking at different differences in the domains 
and different ways that the child responds to items in those domains. We also want to keep in mind when you are um, assessing an intellectually capable young girl that you should expect to see some social strengths. You should expect to see some of the um, good markers that suggest autism isn't there, like some imitation, some joint attention. However, take a look at when the social context becomes more complex, those impairments might become more evident. Second implication I'd like to propose is that we as a field assess emotional regulation skills in the young children we're assessing for autism. Now sometimes this can happen just through behavioral observation. There are also some tools that are being developed that would allow for parent and teacher report of emotional and behavioral responses in different contexts. From what I've been reading, it seems as though the emotional differences in young children are definitely worth considering when we're trying to understand differences between males and females. So while the girls may show some social strengths at young ages, in my experience, they don't show as many emotion regulation strengths, and the literature seems to be backing that up. It's also important to look for differences in emotion regulation across settings and to look at the aspects of emotionality that I've listed here in the third bullet point, because these are the um, emotional issues that I've been seeing in my clinical practice and that colleagues of mine report in their clinical practice when they are working with uh, girls on the spectrum. And some of those include exaggerated emotional intensity, kind of going from zero to 60 uh, very, very quickly, but then also um, categorically stopping that high emotion and jumping into a different emotional state, almost as if these are discontinuous emotional experiences. Parents often report high levels of reactivity, some of which doesn't seem to make a lot of logical sense, or getting stuck emotionally on something and having a hard time moving through it. There can be a lot of black and white thinking about their own feelings or other people's feelings, a misunderstanding, as with boys, of course, that you, you know, can't have one feeling, more than one feeling at a time, for example. There is a lot in the literature and in clinical experience to suggest that whereas boys may not pick up on somebody's affect, girls tend to misinterpret what they're picking up. So several studies are being done to look at possible differences in the perception of emotional cues, but so far the studies that I have found have been with adults, and we don't know much about emotional perception in girls, but this is an area that we want to try to understand better. There are also some reports in the literature about young girls picking up on the emotions of those around them completely out of context. So adopting another person's emotion even when there's no reason for them to actually share in that affective state. That's something we need to understand better. And it could be consistent with some of the identity formation problems we learn about in um, adolescent girls on the spectrum. We also see parent report and teacher report about inappropriate affect as far as what's going on in the context, that the range of affect can be kind of limited and might only be, you know, towards the negative or might only be towards the positive or might only be about mad versus sad. And most importantly, probably from a coping standpoint, we see a limited range of strategies or the ways that a uh, young girl can soothe herself. A third implication we want to consider in our evaluations of young girls is I think it's really important to pay attention to motor functioning, eating, sleeping, and toileting. All of these things could be looked at as lifestyle factors that either help us have a good quality of life or can get in the way. They also have a lot to do with your overall neurological integrity and really speak to how well organized the nervous system is. We all know that when we are deprived of sleep, or we aren't well nourished, or we don't have a chance for exercise, that our mood, our behavior, our cognition are all likely to be affected. So just as I actually would make this recommendation for boys, I think it's really critical that we pay attention to these things in the girls. The other thing that we are seeing in the literature is some increased case reports 
on um, self-harm in females so that girls that may pick at their skin or their fingers that seems to be a behavior that is generating uh, more concern in the um, ABA protocols for example and there's a, a lack of understanding why this occurs and I don't mean to say that we know that this is female specific we are just seeing more case reports now in the field of looking at self-harm as an important and sometimes overlooked indicator in early identification. Our fourth implication is going to be familiar to all of you who operate in this um, in this sector but I, I didn't want to miss it and that is we really need to be careful to not only assess the problems or challenges that a young child has, but to pay attention to the strengths, the interests, and the motivators, and to do this across the lifespan of the individuals that we work with. Given the significant self-esteem issues that we hear from females on the spectrum as they grow older, I think taking a strength-based approach is particularly important with females. We need to have this kind of ongoing programming approach that not only helps to bolster those areas of weakness, but finds ways to make sure every child gets to feel competent and confident and joyful each day in indulging in things they're good at or that they enjoy. And the identification of motivators is going to be hugely helpful as we're trying to work towards encouraging initiation and persistence to task completion. So we need to, I think, begin early in our first evaluations in helping parents and future teams identify strengths as well as areas of weakness. Implication number five, so now that we've sort of thought about cognitive testing, we've thought about strengths, we've thought about motor and adaptive skills. I think it's also important that we consider whether or not the symptom tools that we're using have separate norms for males and females. So we don't yet have this um, for the autism diagnostic observation schedule, for example, but I've heard that some of that is in the works. There are some tools out there that have different norms, still referenced by age, but um, have been compared to samples of boys or samples of girls. The one that I really like is the Social Reciprocity Scale version 2. It's um, a strongly validated tool and provides different versions for preschool, school age, and adults also provides norms by sex and um, has different norms for self-report versus parent report. So that can also be useful. Next suggestion is that we not expect as many obvious repetitive behaviors and unusual interests in the young girls we see. Instead, the literature, and here I'm drawing not just from research, but from some of the self-report accounts and some of the case study literature of adults. So this is a softer evidence-based slide. In general, what we're hearing is that girls or females tend to have more symptoms in the unusual so sensory experience domain, either being over or under sensitive, um, may have more unusual fears than actual um, restricted interests, may have more fixations that are social, so kind of um, becoming overly interested in, a, in one friend or in one adult. There's also in the literature a tendency to identify with animals, not only as an interest, but there are frequent anecdotal reports of a young girl taking on the behaviors of an animal, particularly when under stress, and doesn't necessarily recognize the right time or place for imaginary play. So the animals that I am hearing about clinically, purely anecdotal, a lot of horses, unicorns, and cats. Um, could be other animals, of course, and it's very interesting to consider, does that mean that animals could be a fruitful therapeutic agent for many uh, girls on the spectrum? I would argue quite possibly yes. And particularly anything that encourages that kind of interest is something you wanna capitalize in intervention. So instead of looking for lining up toys, we might want to think about things like a tendency for magical thinking and imaginary friends, and for those things to last longer across development than you might expect. As girls get older, we do see reports that more special interests emerge, and many times those involve, for the cognitively able girls, researching their topics of interest. So what we find is that, as I mentioned, they tend to share interests in similar topics as other girls their age, but they focus more of their time and attention on them. 
Another implication is we want to make sure that we are observing the child not just in this one-on-one -on -one situation with a responsive adult, but we need to see young girls in unprompted play situations that go on for 15, 20, 30 minutes. So not just a quick observation, a real in-depth observation. We want to watch them with other children and pay attention to the complexity of their play, both by themselves or when they're with a peer. What we are seeing is, in general, some limitations in a young girl's ability to generate her own ideas about what to do in play. She may follow the other child, but a, a young girl with autism is less likely to add something new to the play scheme. It's also less common to see a young girl with autism initiate a variety of multi-step play activities when she's on her own, as compared to a young girl without autism who's likely to do that quite well. So you want to pay attention to not only can this child be with a peer, but what's going on when this child is playing with others. The next implication is to try not to be fooled by some intact social skills with a responsive adult. Now, many of us were delighted when we see this good social raw material. We want to see that, and our bias in wanting to see that could cloud our judgment. And it's quite possible that really bright girls are going to show their best selves in some of the diagnostic contexts we tend to use, at least in the clinical world, such as the autism diagnostic observation schedule, where we are, you know, one on one with a child with a structured set of activities. It may be more fruitful to observe the child in unstructured situations with very little adult involvement and look for those qualitative differences in social interactions. It's also important to spend time with parents trying to understand which pro-social behaviors you're watching came naturally from the child and which may have been actively taught or copied from a cartoon or a video. And then the last implication I'd like to share today before turning it over to Kendall for um, her perspective is that I believe we always need to be willing to revisit the question of whether or not this child has ASD later in development. It is quite possible with our current tools and abilities that you will evaluate a two-year-old girl and you'll hear some things that make you wonder if it's autism, but you haven't gathered enough evidence to make the case to make the call. That is a very real phenomena. And in that situation, I think the most important thing we can do is continue to narrate for the parents out loud and for the parents and the team in writing the relative strengths and qualitative differences you are observing, the things that you are concerned about tracking over time, and then continue to monitor and assess those things. That as the social context gets more complex, some of the um, social behaviors we associate with autism could become more observable for girls in those elementary and middle school years. It's also important to make sure that if the child doesn't meet criteria for ASD, but is presenting with a communication delay, for example, or a learning disability or an attention problem, that we identify these girls for special education services and provide them based on their needs. And we should still pull in those interventions from the autism world that may help a particular student, even if she hasn't yet met criteria for the full identification. So I guess what I'm saying is keep ASD on the table. Make sure that you're not completely ruling it out for a lifetime and make sure that you don't you know, continue a trajectory that if this girl were to show more impairments uh, later in functioning, the people would say, oh, but they ruled that out at the age of two. That can't be the case. We have to keep an open mind. And I guess I would uh, finish there by saying the reason that I got interested in this topic is because I was involved in a longitudinal study of young children with autism, and I noticed over time that I was making mistakes in my evaluations. I was seeing two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-old girls. I wasn't identifying autism in those girls at that age, and we were using the best tools we had available at the time. I would see them a few years later, and the autism symptoms were more clear. And I found myself wondering, what did I miss? How did I get this wrong? And what, what could have happened? What kinds of interventions could have been provided to this child um, had we known that she needed 
uh, those services. So in a sense, um, I think there's a certain humbleness that we have to have when we are doing any kind of diagnostic process where you're basing your conceptualization on, you know, behaviors and, and reporting. And there is no medical test. But I think it's particularly important to do as any strong educational evaluation purports to do, which is narrate what you're seeing. It's less about the category or the diagnosis, and it's more about a really clear description of this child's strengths and needs. And quite important to maintain a written record that helps um, to tell the story of what aspects of development are going well and which ones need to be monitored over time. And my last point, one of the things that we need to learn more about in the research is that there tends to be an increase in the social vulnerability or an overly trusting nature in many women on the spectrum. And so now one of the things that interventionists are considering in the field is how can we do a better job at, while trying to encourage, of course, trusting other people, helping girls develop better social cognition skills. So whether they fully meet ASD criteria or present more like a child with a learning disability who also has some social naivete, we want to make sure that we are providing them with some education around how to think about other people and how to um, understand the motives and intentions of others. And now I'd like to turn to a video that we collected together. This is Kendall Nolan, self-advocate and vice president of the board of directors at the ARC of Larimer County. So now I'd like to turn to a, a colleague and self-advocate, Kendall Nolan, to share with us her perspective about why early identification of autism spectrum disorder in girls is important. Kendall, if you don't mind, could you share your perspective on this topic for our audience? Yes, definitely. I think that from a personal standpoint, um, growing up on the autism spectrum was very hard. Um, a lot of resources weren't available. And that was partly because we didn't know I had ASD until I was 15 years old. Um, some interventions with that, with those skills would have been great at an earlier age uh, with social skills and some emotion regulation. Um, yeah, the earlier we can identify girls on the spectrum, the better. It's definitely not labeling. It gives them a sense of who they are and how to cope with it moving forward. Being diagnosed as a teenager can be, or as many women are diagnosed as adults, um, I've heard that could be a lot more challenging because I heard this can be a lot more challenging because they, um, there's a lot of reflection on why they weren't diagnosed. There's a lot of stuff going on in adolescence, brain development going on in adolescence and exploring becoming an adult. And I think um, the younger, the better. So now
Thank you very much, uh, Kendall, for providing that perspective. Really do appreciate your time in doing so. So that concludes our webinar today on the topic of um, early markers of ASD in girls. Um, I have included several references that were key to today's talk. I am happy to provide a full reference list for anybody uh, who's interested. Kendall and I are working on a uh, an article for a journal that will review the literature. So again, I want to thank her for helping me compile the literature and for her perspective in this talk. So thank you all for your time and attention and uh, wish you luck as you continue your professional development in the areas of autism identification. It's really been a pleasure.